Now, before we start learning about atoms and how atoms come together to form molecules and the like, we first have to look at how we approach the uh, discovery of uh, any endeavor, not just biology, but anything. Because what you're going to see throughout the semester is there's a lot of things we know very well. There's a lot of things we know fairly well. And there's a whole lot of things we kind of know about. And the problem is our, our method of investigation, uh, sometimes we just cannot learn all the answers. We either don't have the technology for it, uh, we haven't studied it enough. And so the science, this lecture is all about how we go about learning um, new information. And it doesn't just apply, like I said, to biology. In fact, a good number of your questions are going to have nothing to do with biology. They're going to talk about problem solving your car, I'm forking out $500 for a stupid alternator like I am um, right now. So whether you're a mechanic and you get paid really well to problem solve, whether you're a computer designer or, or a program designer and you're figuring out issues and all that, the same methodology applies. So this is going to be important because we're not only going to learn why and how we gain information, but you're going to see why we make so many mistakes today too. So you can see that, yes, we're not trying to trick everybody by saying, oh shoot, we got this wrong. It's just the methodology is not uh, always perfect and the way we execute it is not always perfect because it's very difficult to do. So that's the goal of this lecture is to see what the scientific method is, how it applies, and very specifically, what is our level of acceptance of the various concepts that we're going to learn from hypothesis through law. All right, so let's start with the, the first thing. The scientific method is not as simple as we usually portray it. We're going to put it forward simply today, but and, 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 you know, in a way of four steps, and you go through those four steps. It's not as simple as that, but we're going to study it in this simp simplified version. Because the real thing is as you go through these steps, you're always hitting hurdles. You've got to discover a new technology, some new protocol, and you get stuck in various parts and have to go round and round and round until you can you know, plow through to the next level. And that's why it takes so many freaking years in your graduate work and all that stuff. So. The scientific method is essentially a way of gathering information. It's a framework of repeatable um, uh, experimentation. So that's how mechanics are able to deduce, well, this is how things should work, this is out of place, this is the issue, at least good mechanics can. And as far as scientists go, they're trying to observe what's going on and understand the natural laws that are in our universe. Um, but this can apply to any type of endeavor, not just science, not just cars, not just computers, but any endeavor where you're trying to understand how everything works. That's really what it's all about. So this shows more of a cyclical nature of the scientific method because it never ends, ever, um, until we know everything and that's not going to happen anytime soon. So the reason why it's cyclical is because we build upon our prior knowledge. We're constantly making greater and greater discoveries based upon what we've learned in the past. And that's one of the important aspects, as you can see here, to make known what we discover so that others can work off of our shoulders, so to speak, and we can make greater and greater advancements. If we lose that knowledge and, and, and you have a society that's completely isolated from that, then they have to start all over again or start from scratch. I mean, that knowledge has to be passed on, otherwise it's lost. So, there are four main steps. I know there's several things in here, but there's four main steps that you're going to be tested on. They're representative of, again, how your uh, multiple choice questions are going to be. And they're as follows. Observation, hypothesis, experiment, and conclusion. So those are the four basic steps of the scientific method. So let's start with number one, observation. A lot of times people just kind of miss this one as a, a, an actual step of the scientific method, but let me give you some uh, um, background history as far as uh, why that's so important. 
until scientists had actually been able to create microscopes and see the very, very small, we couldn't come up with cell theory. We didn't understand that living things were made of cells. We couldn't see that small. The resolution of our eyes is just not that good. So until we were, had the technology to start observing the very, very small, we didn't understand some of the fundamentals of life. Well, let's go broader. Let's go out into the universe. Scientists are constantly trying to figure out how our universe works and whatnot. They've got massive telescopes and satellites and other things. Well, they've discovered, they've known this for quite a while, but it's fairly well accepted and, and uh, um, uh, among scientists, is that about 96% of our universe is unobservable by us. This constitutes two main substances which we call dark matter and dark energy. That means when you look out in the night sky and you see all those stars and you know that there's other things and nebulas and other things out there, that's 4% of our universe. So there's quite a bit that we have yet to learn because 96% of it is unobservable. Now how do we know that it even exists? Well we're only now beginning to see the influence that this matter has on the 4% of observable matter. But we cannot directly observe this yet. So there's a substantial amount of observation yet to come about once we start figuring out how to make those observations of what our universe is really made of. It would be like living in the ocean and knowing what the individual salt particles are but not knowing what water is. I mean, that's how ridiculous it is. So. Observation is the very first step. You need to be able to observe something if you're going to learn about it. You know, so without the necessary tools or instrumentation, I mean, we have radio waves going through us all the time. We have all sorts of electromagnetic uh, energy passing through. And without the proper tools, we're completely unaware of it. You just can't detect radio waves unless you have something that can pick that signal up and interpret it. All right. So, once we make an observation, the natural tendency is to ask, what is it that we're observing? But that's not an actual step of the scientific method. That's just a, hey, what is that? What's that dark matter? What is that cell or whatnot? So, the second stage of the scientific method is to formulate what we call a hypothesis. Now, a hypothesis is your educated guess, and we stress educated, um, but it's a guess, nonetheless, of what it is you're observing. So you see something and you're like, hey, uh, I think it's this. Now, the more knowledge you have about a particular phenomena, fixing a car, <coughs> computer programming, the more knowledge you have, the better your hypothesis. For example, let's look at a car. You wake up, as I did, 6 o'clock this morning. You go out to your car, you try to start it, and it doesn't start, as always. Okay, so there's a number of reasons on why a car won't start. Your observation is the car won't start. Your hypothesis is what is wrong? What ultimately is making it so that the car will not start? So let's come up with some viable hypothesis. Let me throw a really bad one out there. The tires are flat. Would that be a good hypothesis? Why not? Because it has nothing to do with whether the car will start. Well, what if I'm from the 18th century or you know 17th century or whatnot? I don't have any prior knowledge of what, what matters in the car. But today, most of us have a good understanding, at least, of some of the basic mechanics of a car. But that's where a good mechanic can get right to the problem. A bad mechanic, or a dishonest one, muddles around and, you know, doesn't quite get to the actual reason. So let's look at some viable hypotheses on why the car won't start. Okay, Battery. battery's dead. What else? My alternator is not working. Starter. Actually, it fried my car instead of not being able to. Um, starter. So you're dealing with things like the solenoid and other instruments. What is another easy yeah. reason? Gas. Okay, out of gas. 
So being cold, we usually know that that tends to have an effect on batteries, especially when they sit there for long periods of time. So let's just choose this one. There's many we can choose from, and there's actually little warning signs when you try to start up the car that the more you know, you can even do a diagnostic in the moment that you're trying to figure out what's going on. It's not necessarily an experiment, but again, the more knowledge you have, the more you can be like, well, the car doesn't even turn over. So it's very likely the battery, but if the car's turning over, then you're dealing with maybe some other issue or some or whatnot. So the more you know about it, the more you can get to the answer right away. So let's deal with an experiment. Let's say that the battery is dead. What are some good approaches to testing your hypothesis? And here's the other aspect about a hypothesis. It must be testable. There are many hypotheses out there that people have regarding various uh, observable phenomena, and a good majority of them can't even be tested. So they're not good hypotheses because a good hypothesis has even the capacity of being tested, theoretically or otherwise. Sometime experimentally where we actually perform something, but there's a lot of theoretical physicists out there that are you know, able to say, well, theoretically this is possible. And so that just leads us in the right direction or whatnot. So experiment-wise, what can you do? The What's that? Replace the OK, you can replace it. You can try to jump start it. Those are two. Anything else you can do? You can test other things, and if they're not bad, the like, process of elimination. OK. so. If you have the instrumentation, you can um, weed out some of the other factors to try to get it all the way down to one. I don't know how I write that up there, but I won't do that. The way it sounds. Okay, so the, as you start it, the, the sounds that it makes. Okay, so obviously most of us don't have the knowledge that a mechanic has and we usually go with the simplest solution. Okay, What's, what do we usually do when the battery is dead? What's the most obvious thing? We pretty much try to jump start it because we don't want to pay the money to replace a battery if we're not sure that that's what it is. Um, we just want to see, hey, maybe it's just so cold outside that it, it's just ran out of energy and we just need to give it a jump start and it'll work as long as the alternator works. Um, so let's go through the experiment process. You have to make sure, and this is where things start getting where you're going to understand why scientists make so many mistakes, why we have drugs that get out there that uh, are recalled, why we keep revising the things is because you really can't set up the most perfect experiment, but you can get close. The better you set up your experiment, the, the better your ultimate knowledge comes into play. The worse you do your experiment, you know, the worse things tend to be. So there are a number of ways in which you can do this experiment. For example, make sure that the cables are set up properly or you're going to get a nice little jolt. Um, how long do you let it go for? Do you let it go for a minute? No, you got to let it go for longer. Experience shows that it takes, you know, maybe even 10 minutes. Now there are other things that can apply a larger voltage if you're not doing it car to car. You know, there's many ways to do this. But there are right and wrong ways. If you do it too little, you haven't performed the experiment properly to test your hypothesis that the battery is dead. So we're going to spend some time a little bit later on today looking at how to set up an experiment well so that you can reliably say, yeah, I did a good enough job that this is, these results are good. Okay. So we set up our experiment, we jump start the car, let's say we do it right as you're supposed to jump start the car, and then at the end we turn the ignition, the car starts up. Now, this is a part that people tend to get confused on, especially when it comes to testing uh, aspects. So I'm going to make it really simple for you. The starting up of the car, the eureka moment where you're like, yay, I can go to my class and well, maybe not a eureka moment, but yeah, I get to go to my class and whatnot. All of that's part of the experiment. The conclusion only has one statement to it. There's actually two possible statements, but it's one or the other. 
you either support your hypothesis or you reject your hypothesis. That's the conclusion. It's not the crunching of your numbers. It's not even the analysis of your data. It's not any aspects. That's all part of the experiment. So usually, when in doubt, most of the time you spend, in your PhD or other things like that, is in this part right here. Okay? And then you write you know, a 200 page long paper and one sentence at the end, which is your conclusion, that you were right or you were wrong. Usually you have to be right to move on. Um, so, it's not the analysis of your data. It's not, hey, the car started up. That's not the conclusion. It's, was I right? Was it the battery? Yes. So, we support our hypothesis. Let's say you go through this process and the car still doesn't start up. And you, you tested everything you could about the battery. Then what would you do? Would you support your hypothesis? No, you reject it. Because you're like, well, I tested it. It's not the battery. Now, what do you have to do? You go back and you take up a new hypothesis. So if the battery is not dead, what's well, another likely problem? Alternator, yeah. Yeah, that, that could be another aspect of it. I usually would choose the gas, but, um, you know, my kids are not old enough to drive yet, but when they do, I know they're going to leave it out of gas all the time. So, the main point of this is when you're thoroughly convinced and you reject your hypothesis, you go back and do a new hypothesis. You don't go back to here and start messing around with the data until you support it. That's when you start getting into trouble. That's when you get certain dishonesty in pharmaceutical companies where they just kind of skip certain steps, skip certain data, and push something through. I'm not saying all pharmacies are dishonest. I'm just saying that dishonesty is out there. So in some situations, people don't do what they should do, which is go back to the drawing board. Because this going back to here can mean millions of dollars. It's understandable why sometimes people don't want to do that. Now, to make things a little easier for others, we, as we gain this data, we publish it because we need to work on the shoulders of others, like I said. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything that comes out in these journals is absolutely correct. There have been really bad PR <coughs> things where people have come out with things that have been published in really vetted journals and they've been shown to be a farce or false or whatnot. And, it's, and the reason why it's so bad is because it puts a bad light on the other scientists that are honestly being honest and trying to do well. So yes, there are situations where scientists will fabricate and lie, but my experience shows that most do the best that they can. Yes, you've got always some bad apples in every type of uh, endeavor you do. Now, this is more of my soapbox, but uh, you're not going to be tested on this, but this is really an important aspect. Maybe one of these days I will test on it. But one of the biggest pet peeves that I have is that the media, mostly the media, but the media and other uh, sources of information will take what scientists publish and say, and use that for their own <coughs> agenda. They'll say, hey, this is what the science is, so therefore we must do this. And the problem is they're implying that because of certain results that we have to do these things. And the reality <coughs> is science is impartial. Science is just about gaining knowledge. It doesn't tell us what we should do with that knowledge, nor how we should use it. So we have to make ethical and moral judgments all the time about what and how to do with the new knowledge and new information we're getting. But it pisses me off to no end when, I'm not just saying politicians, but anybody uses the data to say, well, then we have to do this, okay? It's not, they should be separate issues. It should be, hey, this is what's happening. Now, we as a society, what should we do about it? And I think that's the biggest problem is most people will reject the science because they reject 
the judgment of how we should use that science. And that's a big thing that we're dealing with today. And I blame the media for that. But sometimes we as scientists don't get our point across as well. We, we tend to want certain things. We're human. We want these, you know, progress to be made and other things like that. So just be aware that there are many out there that the reason why people usually reject certain scientific theories is because of what people are saying we should do or what you should understand this to be based upon that theory. And hopefully as we go through here, you'll see that once you understand the science of it, it it's just about knowledge. It's about learning how things really are. Okay. Okay, now with that, this is on your quiz. So it's important that we understand these aspects. As we go through the scientific method, there is a certain level of confidence that we have in our knowledge. Now, a hypothesis is merely an educated guess. It has zero supporting data to it. As such, it is the weakest of any concept because anybody can make up a hypothesis. Anybody can come up with a reason, a guess. So when we look at the progression of the scientific method, it has to start somewhere. We observe something, we've got to at least try to reason it out. And that's where hypothesis begins. Now, if you go through one round of the scientific method, it doesn't immediately become a theory. Okay? It has to go through sometimes thousands of vetted experiments before the general scientific community accepts it as a valid hypothesis. At that point, then we call it a theory. So a theory, the main difference between a theory and a hypothesis is a theory is a more thoroughly tested and accepted hypothesis. That's really what a theory is. Which is also why when I watch shows it pisses me off when people use the word wrong. They come upon some scenario they see you know, a dead guy, they're like, hmm, well, here's my theory. No, it's your hypothesis, is what he has. Not a theory, until he tests that. So, theory is essentially a well-accepted hypothesis. The scientific community or the community in that discipline uh, um, pretty much says, yeah, this is how it is. Now, this doesn't mean, one, that we know everything about it, but it is the best explanation that we have amongst all possible explanations. And so when Reagan and others say, oh, it's just a theory, that really hurts right here, you know, because it's not just a hypothesis, okay? Now, if you said, oh, that's just a hypothesis, then yeah, have that. But it's not just a theory. And so there's several theories. For example, cell theory does a good job of explaining what life is because as of yet to date, we have not seen anything that exhibits the characteristics of life that is not made of cells. Remember, there is still debate about viruses and whatnot. So again, that's where theories come into play. Most scientists accept cell theory as the theory that all living things are made of cells. But there's some that still reject that and say, nope, viruses are alive. They exhibit all the characteristics that we consider life, and there's and it's good, healthy debate. Okay? We're not choking each other out and trying to, you know, thwart each other or whatnot. We're just trying to learn what life is. Now, principles. Principles are more concrete concepts, but they don't explain the broad subject. What do I mean by that? For example, we have the theory of evolution. It describes many things, and it, it reasonably shows how things progress. However, within that theory, there are some more concrete concepts, which we call principles. In fact, within the theory of evolution, there are five principles. Everybody knows about one of them, natural selection. But there are other principles that govern evolution, such as mutation, and gene flow, and genetic drift. Don't worry about writing all those down and sexual selection and whatnot. These are principles of evolution. So a principle is more narrow in its scope of what it defines. It's not as broad as a theory, okay? You can almost equate principles with facts. 
So, but we understand it better. So in that endeavor to understand how a theory works, how the mechanics of evolution work, or understanding the dynamics, well, there's many theories we're gonna go through this semester. Um, we usually incorporate what we call principles, which are very well-defined concepts, very well-defined facts within that theory. Now in the end, this is what we're after. We want to know how everything absolutely works. And this is where law comes into play. There's many laws that we have in science. We have laws of what we call thermodynamics, where we understand how chemicals and, th and molecules interact with one another. Um, we have uh, the law of gravity, you know, where we understand how gravity works so well that we can predict you know, I throw this pen at a certain distance, at an angle, or whatnot, I know exactly where it's going to fall. Okay, so the more we understand a concept, the more we can predict what the outcome is going to be. That's really what our endeavor is in the scientific method, is to understand how everything works. Now, even in biology, we have laws. They're called the laws of inheritance. We understand how biological inheritance works so well that we can make calculated predictions about the outcome. That you have these two individuals, they have a 25% chance of having a child with cystic fibrosis. Those are the laws of inheritance. And we'll learn that later on in lecture 15 or so. So as we go through, you're going to see these concepts over and over and over. Cell theory, theory of evolution, Bayless electron shell theory, that's next lecture, um, and whatnot. Then we've got natural selection as a principle. We've got the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, which is part of valence electron shell theory. And that's next lecture and whatnot. We've got theories of our laws of gravity, thermodynamics, entropy. I told you about entropy. That's a law. That's a pervading law through the entire universe on how energy is transferred and the like. So that's really the goal of the scientific method, to understand everything. And this is the progression. Now, for the last part of this, let's look at experiments. We're going to talk about drug trials. We're going to talk about, you know, a number of different things that, that come up today. Why did I get the H3N2 virus? Uh, you know, why did people who got the flu shot get that virus as well? Um, we'll show why we make mistakes in... Um, creating vaccinations in uh, doing drug trials and discovery and whatnot because it is so difficult to work with as dynamic a system as is the human body okay it's much simpler to work on a car or to work on some other aspect to figure out what's going on the mechanics of a car is much easier than the mechanics of a living being so when we do these experiments there are many, many things that we have to control for. Most of the time, we can't control for them all. And one of the biggest uh, um, uh, things that we have to deal with first is sample size. There are billions of people on the planet. But when you're creating a drug, you can't test it in every single person. So you have to take a sample size, a representative group. And this is where we get into problems because if you're not representing every ethnic group or genetic diversity on the planet, if you're not taking samples from you know, people all over, then your sample size only represents a small portion of the general populace as a whole. This is why when drugs get vetted and they go through, they're expecting that there are certain parameters they didn't test for with people with certain genetic diversity in India or in Africa or in some other area where we might not have sampled from and tested the drug in our human trials. Um, so in that scenario, the more representative sample you can get, the better your data is going to be. Okay? You cannot extrapolate and say, well, I took someone from every continent except for uh, Asia. Well, that's where most of the people on the planet live. Um, so you need to have a representative sample. Now, when you get that representative sample that you're doing your experiment on, be it a drug trial, whatever the case may be, there are the 
variables. And this is where things become so difficult. Because in any scientific endeavor, the only way to look at cause and effect, I give you a drug, I want to see what happens as a result. The only way to look at repeatable cause and effect is to make sure that there is only one variable that you're accounting for. Everything else gets standardized, so to speak. So let's look at the different variables that have to be factored in. The independent variables is what you manipulate. Let me give you some examples. Let's say we create a vaccination, okay? And we want to determine how much of the vaccine we want to give to allow the children or whatever group, whether it's adults for the flu virus or whatever the case may be, uh, we wanted to test how much of it we need to give for it to be effective or so effective. That's the independent variables. It's what you manipulate. Within these independent variables, we have what's called the placebo effect, which is a big problem, especially in humans. We have to do this because due to the complex nature of our physiology, the mere thought that we're taking something that will cure us causes a chemical release, causes a physiological change that can actually get us better. So we think we get better, it's the positive attitude or whatever the case may be, we think we're getting some drug, and we do. And they've shown that if they've got a group of individuals that take no, nothing whatsoever, and they give another group just some sugar pill, they say, hey, this is gonna cure your migraine. There is a significant difference they didn't give them anything but just a little bit of sugar, but they didn't know that. And so when we look at drug trials, we have to see something above and beyond the placebo effect. Because if you're looking at something like this, your drug is crap. Um, it's no different than the placebo effect. So that's why we have to do that. Now, another thing that has to be done when we're doing placebo controls is what we call a double blind where the person giving it doesn't even know which drug it is. And why would we have to do that? Those are variables that have to be accounted for because if you're doing something of this nature and all of a sudden you see something like this, then somebody probably leaked what the placebo, which one's the placebo and which one's not. And people are like, well, I'm not getting the placebo, so, you know, type of thing. So it can really mess up your results by not accounting for all of these variables. That's why when we do placebos, neither the person giving nor the person receiving knows uh, which is the right, you know, which one's the right drug and which one's just an inert substance like sugar or salt or whatever the case may be. All right. So a placebo or the actual vaccine. These are what we call the independent variables. What you manipulate. In this situation, you're not changing the vaccine, you're just changing the amount. So those are the controls, the manipulated variables. The second type of variables are, what's the outcome? Do we call these the dependent variables because they depend upon what you manipulate for the independent variables. So the dependent variables is, what's the outcome? What's the results of that? So they showed that when they gave children this placebo, it wasn't actually a virus, it was it was administered the same way and whatnot, but there was no virus that about 15% of them got sick. When they gave a low, down, low dose, a little less, and they're like, oh, this is the minimum we need to give at this point to be able to have the virus be effective. So that's, that was their conclusion. But there are so many other things that go into it to make sure that you get accurate results. Well, let's look at uh, some uh, examples. And this is where the third set of variables comes in. This is the most difficult part of any experiment. We call them standardized variables. So what are standardized variables? Basically, all other factors need to be held constant so that only the independent variables and the dependent variables become correlated. Let me give you some examples. Let's say for some reason that in this group, you just couldn't find 80 children, so they ended up just having like 10. And the others, they had 86, 78, and 87. That would not be keeping everything standard. 
because you would end up getting a different set of statistics with just 10 children than you would with 80. So they try to keep these numbers as close as possible. Ideally, they would be all the same. Okay? How do you administer it? Do you inject some children with a needle and others give a droplet? That's going to change your outcome. So you need to make sure you administer it. I mean, you poke a child with a needle, you're going to cause a physiological reaction that might mess something up. I mean, we're very dynamic creatures. So if you give one, ch one group a dropper with a vaccine, you better do it to all. And so on and so forth. If you give them five drops, you give five drops to all and, and all of that. Keeping everything standard. That's probably the most difficult thing to do. Because you've got to also have the representation. If you have 80 children, but they're from one ethnic group and 80 from a different ethnic group, that's not good. You're not keeping things standard. You need to make sure that all are represented in that group. Otherwise, you get too many variables to account for. Because it could be that this ethnic group just has an innate immunity to that virus and you, that you didn't account for. And you're like, oh, well, this is the minimum. And then you try it out, out, out there and people are getting sick. Okay? So that's where problems come into play. All right, so let's do some more examples. Let's say you're doing some farming. Scientists want to know whether or not they should add fertilizer to their crops. Well, plants don't have the same physiology as you and I. They don't understand that they're getting fertilizer versus not fertilizer, but you still have to do a placebo-like effect. You're like, well, why do we need to do a placebo effect? Well, let me uh, show you. Let's say that you have these crops in the dirt, and in this one where you're not going to add any fertilizer, this is your control. This is your placebo or whatnot. And over here, let's say you add a pound of fertilizer, and here two pounds of fertilizer. Well, adding that extra pound or two might be the main reason. It might not be your fertilizer. It may just be the fact that you've added more weight to the soil and other things. So one of the biggest issues you have to deal with is if you add a pound of fertilizer, you better add a pound of something inert that's in the soil to compensate so that they're in the same amount of soil. Maybe the roots don't have as much space as these roots to grow and these absorb more nutrients. Again, you're standardizing the variables between all of these. So even though you control for the amount that you give, and those are your independent variables, how much fertilizer you give, you need to be making sure that everything else remains constant. The volume of dirt that these are in, and so, and so on and so forth. Now in the end, obviously, these are the dependent variables. How, what's the yield? How many uh, um, uh, tomatoes did you get per vine? And as a result, you can make some conclusions. Now the sample size wasn't great. They did three plants. It could have been much more. So it's not that great of an experiment when you're only doing such a small number. It doesn't represent the whole. Okay, let's do one more. Let me show you one more. Um, here's another experiment. Now all of these are potential experiments on your quiz. Some of you might get one where it describes this plant. They're very simple. They're very straightforward. Um, and the only thing that you're really going to be tested on is I'll describe this process and say, oh, when they gave no fertilizer, low fertilizer, or high fertilizer, what type of variable was this? Oh, that's the independent variable. Or when they looked at the yield of the tomatoes, what type of variable was that? That's the dependent variable, you know, and, and the like. So, let's do one more. Scientists have a question. They, they think that, they have a hypothesis, that... Uh, People will get ulcers primarily due to a particular strain of bacteria that's in their gut. So they want to test this hypothesis. Well, in order to test this hypothesis, their manipulated or independent variables is they use a, a couple of different antibiotics because they want to uh, um, see which antibiotics might kill that strain of bacteria better. Okay? And then ultimately what the outcome is as far as ulcers go. The dependent variables is do the ulcers that the people get uh, decrease as a result of the treatment? So obviously you're going to have your placebo group that gets an inert substance. It's not an antibiotic at all, but it's inert. And you find that 10% of them actually have reduced ulcers just by taking a placebo. 
And then you look at antibiotic A and antibiotic B and you see your respective results of how many people got better from the ulcers. Now the hardest part here again is the standardized variables. Here you've got a mix of people up there of different races, different ages, men and women. Hopefully you know we're very different uh, from one another. So it would not be a good idea to put all the women in one group, all the men in one, another group. Uh, and there's nothing left for the third group. But if you have you know, men and women in a third group and men represented that way, it's not standardized because there's gonna be substantial differences in our overall physiology. So each group needs to be represented. Ideally, you would have groups of triplets. Now, the only triplets that I know of are my sisters. Um, she does have triplets, I'll get more into that later. But identical triplets because all of their genetics are pretty much the same and they're all the same sex and so on and so forth. But we really can't do that. So we do the best that we can by reducing any variation between ethnic groups, between age, between um, uh, male and female physiology and the like. That's really what standardized variables is all about. Making sure that if there are differences that they're represented in each of the groups so that in the end we manipulate a variable and we see some outcome and we can draw a direct correlation between those two. There's no other confounding factors. Think about the car scenario again. If you were to have a hypothesis that the battery was dead but you're like, I just don't have time to just test the battery. I've got to, make, I've got to test another hypothesis. You fill up the gas and you jump start the battery while you're filling up the gas. And then you start the car, you're like, yay, it was both. No, because you didn't account for one variable at a time. You were looking at two different things. You wouldn't be able to know which one it was. The same thing is true. And that's why you effectively look at one variable at a time. Otherwise, you just don't know which variable it was. All right, now we've got about five more minutes here. I'm gonna let you dissect down this Calvin and Hobbes and come up with the fundamental scientific method, the observation, the hypothesis, the experiment, and the conclusion. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about what he did right or wrong with his experiment, from sample size to you know, the, the overlying you know, uh, design of it and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so what's his observation? That it's hot, okay? That's his observation. It's really hot outside. Now, he has a hypothesis. What is it? That it's hot enough on the sidewalk to fry an egg. That's a pretty specific hypothesis, and from his observation, that it's very well may happen. Now, here's where he gets into the experiment part. Let's look, dissect his experiment, and we'll pick it apart a little, in a little bit. How many eggs did he use? One. How long did he let it sit there? Probably a couple seconds, you know? Longer than, uh, not, a long, not nearly long enough or whatnot. Um, he had to choose a spot on the sidewalk to do it in. And he had to get a carton of eggs from somewhere and whatnot. And there's all these parameters. Obviously it could be done better. How many eggs would you have used? I would have used all of them. In fact, I did when I was his age. Um, so, actually twice that, according to my mom. But, um, I would use all of them. Large sample size. Sample size one, not so good. The timing of it. The cho choice of his location. What's a variable that he may not have accounted for that you see in the first slide? Yeah. He may have got some shade in that particular spot, and so therefore it's not as hot. You didn't account for that. So he maybe needed to distribute the eggs all along the sidewalk like I did. Um, so, uh, timing. Let it go a little bit longer, boy. Um, it takes a lot longer even in a hot pan for it to cook like that. How cooked did he want it to be? That was another factor that he didn't address in his hypothesis or that he accounted for. Over easy or, you know, a little bit... Uh, uh, burnt or whatnot. Okay, besides all of his problems with his experiment that we can definitely improve upon, what was his ultimate conclusion? Did he support or reject his hypothesis? He rejected it. So what was his new hypothesis? It's 
hotter on the car dash. So instead of, is it hot enough to fry an egg on the sidewalk, he changed it to say, well, maybe it's hot enough to fry an egg on the car dash, which is not a bad change of his hypothesis because maybe intuitively, like we all know, metal conducts heat a lot faster than concrete does. So it's not a bad change of his hypothesis, but if he does it the same way he did here, he might still run into one of the issues that he dealt with. Okay, so that just gives, kind of gives you an idea. You will not have a Calvin and Hobbes quiz question, but this is just to get you thinking about the process of problem solving that we all do on a daily basis. How do we approach an observation and our hypothesis about how the world works around us?